So welcome to Technocon. As you know, uh, many of you know, this is a community that we started, uh, we being Rajan from uh, LinkedIn and Jenny Blackburn, who was at Salesforce at the time, uh, she retired since. Uh, we started this community uh, a few years back um, because we realized that, I was at the tw uh, Twitter at the time, we realized that uh, people like us would, in technology companies uh, needed a place to get together and compare notes and, and uh, uh, share with one another how we're going about various things that are slightly different for technical folks that they are in sort of traditional L&D. Um, and so that started as a sort of an informal group uh, called TechLearn. And then in 2018, we uh, got together for an annual conference at LinkedIn, hosted at LinkedIn um, uh, for the first time uh, in a larger format. And then this picture was taken last year at Twitter. Um, so this is... Uh, Many of you are on this photo. So this is basically who's who of technical L&D in Silicon Valley, at least at the time, uh, 2019. And since COVID hit, we moved this online to this round table. So that's kind of a little bit about the, the, the history. Uh, super quickly, we, uh, we have a board um, that's uh, mentioned by Jean uh, already from LinkedIn. Uh, Katie is at Twitter, Chris is at Microsoft, let's take Chris here. Myself and Andrew is also here uh, from Shopify. And our job is to really uh, kind of put together some lightweight guidelines uh, for, for the community. So objective is to create a safe place, be a good citizen, respect privacy, do not solicit, that sort of thing. Uh, we also had a board meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, and we sort of reflected on, hey, we started this new format round table since COVID hit, what's working? What should we do differently? We've been doing this micro optimizations, micro experiments, right? Like, do we do three speakers, two speakers today? You have one speaker. Uh, so, so we've been changing the format a little bit. Uh, and so again, today is gonna be a slight variation in the format, uh, giving you more breakout time because that's what you told us you care about. And then less of uh, the uh, speaker time. So we have one, but a great speaker. Uh, what we're gonna try doing going forward so is skip October uh, and then do something bigger in November. So we're thinking of uh, not doing every month, but maybe every other month, and then doing it a little bit more significant and giving you a little bit more heads up time so that you can book uh, the, the allocated time. So, so maybe have a few more speakers and then maybe run for a couple hours. So yet to be determined, uh, but we're just trying things out you get a survey at the end, so we appreciate your feedback. Uh, and that's how we sort of uh, keep developing the community uh, forward. So look out for the survey. Um, we have other ways to get engaged, out of which the most significant is probably the Slack community. Uh, so I did not put a link here, but it's technocon.slack.com. Uh, and uh, look out for that uh, as well. Uh, Marianne, maybe we can post that in the chat as well. So for a random new person that has not joined the Slack community yet, uh, so that they know as well. Uh, and of course, there's Marianne and Joe who run the show and all, do all the heavyweight lifting behind the scenes. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge them. So with that, uh, so the agenda for today is we're going to start with the breakouts. And the point of the breakouts is that you told us you appreciate getting to know the, your peers at other companies and just kind of like not just having these presentations but also getting to interact with one another. Uh, so we're gonna open up with a, a short breakout, 10 minutes, uh, bring you back in, reflect on anything that resonated and then we're gonna give it uh, over to Cameron from who runs engineering, um, on, uh, engineering education at, at Uber. Uh, and then we're gonna do closing breakouts and, uh, and be done within an hour. So that's the game plan for today. So with that, very shortly, we're gonna put you in breakout rooms. Um, there is a uh, prompt question. I'm gonna come up with a question every time. So if there are 20, if there were 24 hours in a day, how would you spend this extra hour? So, so have that conversation um, with, uh, with your, uh, um, our breakout mates. So, see you in about 10 minutes. Um, and I believe Marianne is going to drop us into breakouts. Um, there is a uh, prompt question. I'm going to come up with a question every time. So, 
if there are 20 if there were 24 hours in a day how would you spend that extra hour so so have that conversation um with uh with your uh um, fellow breakout mates so see you in about 10 minutes um and i believe marian is gonna drop us into breakouts <clears throat> Next is reflections. So anything that, any takeaways, anything that resonated, uh, any patterns that, that you observed, feel free to just uh, shout it out. <laughs> we, we had a couple of people who wanted more sleep. I wanted more time outside to be physically active. Um, yeah. Anything else? Marco, I mentioned that I wanted one hour to do absolutely nothing. I, 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 I second that. I see all those guitars, Sujan. That, yeah. There's oh, yeah, maybe an hour to do nothing. No, okay. Anybody else? Anything that resonated? Um, oh, I see there's a number of things in the chat as well. Uh, uh, that's right. Uh, I, how can I forget the Korean drama time? Uh, family time, etc. Time to read. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, awesome. And, and hopefully the goal was obviously not to learn what, how you sp spend the 25th hour, but to give you a closer relate, uh, relatedness to, to your peers. So hopefully we accomplish that. So with that, uh, let's go into the, we're going to uh, jump into the round table with uh, Cameron uh, uh, soon. I just want to kind of set some ground rules. So. Uh, Please be muted if you have any questions. Oh, please have questions, uh, not if you have questions. Have questions, pose them via the chat and you can pose them to everyone. So just you know, feel free to, to share your question with everyone. The more the merrier. Uh, and, um, um, and then I'll be reading the questions. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be summing up the questions for Cameron at the end uh, so, so that we kind of have that. So he doesn't need to worry that much about reading or watching the, the chat window because it can be taxing. If you have any technical issues or other questions like that, of that nature, feel free to co contact Marianne uh, directly. So she's sitting there uh, ready to help you out with anything specific. Uh, but for speaker questions, just direct them directly in the chat, share with everyone, and then we'll pick them up um, uh, after, afterwards. And uh, a, a, a side note, uh, Cameron's presentation requires for you to have a phone. So have your phone ready as well. Uh, so. Um, yeah, it's, we're doing something different this time around. It's going to be a little in, more interactive. So, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Cameron, who is a senior program manager uh, at Uber, and he focuses on, on engineering training, onboarding, uh, and things like that. And, we're, and, and he'll be talking about some specific challenges that Uber, being Uber, being global and being physical, uh, has to deal with it that are different uh, than than other companies. Uh, and lots of lots of lessons to pick up from that. So with that, I'll hand it over to Cameron. Uh, you can start sharing your screen if you want. Uh, cool. Thanks, Marco. Hey, everyone. Hey, everyone. Um, it's really nice to meet slash see everyone. Um, I know it's uh, a Wednesday with a lot going on in the world. Um, would encourage you if you are able to be in a place to keep your video on, um, that would be cool just to be able to see you when we're speaking and feel a bit more engaged. Um, if you're not, it's totally fine, but I have a laptop and a screen so I can see everyone's faces and it's nice to make it feel like I'm not all alone. And, you know, to Marco's point about using your phone, I really just like looking for a lot of friends during COVID. So I'm just going to give my phone number out and like, please just text me. And like, that's no, that's completely not the point of having your cell phone, but I can see your faces and like two people smiled at that joke. So I feel like we're ready to, we're ready to roll. Um, so as Marco said, um, 
I'm Cameron. I've been at Uber now for almost two years, which is wild. Sometimes feels like two weeks, sometimes feels like 200 years. Um, and I work on a team internally in our engineering organization focused on technical and non-technical training of our engineers. Um, uh, myself and, and a colleague of mine, Sage, is here today, um, work really closely on the onboarding program for new engineers and data scientists. Um, I do not come from a software engineering background. Before uh, Uber, I worked at a tech boot camp, and then before that was a middle school teacher and assistant principal. So um, come, at, come at this whole world from a lens of education and learning, um, and have picked up the technical skills um, as we go. So to highlight the piece of the kind of, I, I, I hope what will be fun part of, of today's talk, um, we're gonna use a tool called Slido. And you can do this on your phone if you don't have a separate window open, but you can also join um, just in another web browser. Um, just by now that most people's videos are on, just by a show of hands, has anyone used Slido before? And of those people, keep your hand up if you use it for something that is not just the basic Q&A uploading and downloading. Okay, perfect. So we're gonna kind of all learn a new tool together. And in fact, I am by no means an expert in Slido and actually just started poking around and decided that this would be more fun than the Zoom polling feature and a little bit more robust. So we're gonna use Slido for some interaction during the talk, just to keep you all engaged and I'll show you how it works. Um, so uh, if you are, on the Slido page, it probably says something like, no polls are active, and that's exactly, then, then you're there. Um, as I'm talking, you may see this on a slide, and that means there'll be a question or a, a moment for you to be engaged um, as we roll. And it's so funny, you know, I, I come from, as I said, a middle school teaching environment, and as soon as you say, like, you might have to do something, people kind of like crane their neck a little bit and come to the screen, and I swear I just saw five people be like, hmm. So this is gonna be fun. Um, we're going to talk about onboarding and uh, how we've scaled things um, pre and, and post COVID. So at Uber, um, we, our onboarding program is called Education, which is uh, a, a obviously a play on engineering and education. It's our onboarding program for all of these job titles. It's also the oldest um, functional onboarding program uh, at Uber. Uh, Uber has been around for about 10 years and education has been around for about five. Um, the program is all, the content is curated and everything is facilitated by internal subject matter specialists that we call educators. They're engineers, data scientists, managers, ICs, all different levels and experience all over the company and all over the world. Um, and our team works with them on curating the content, developing in a way that's digestible um, and, uh, um, you know, on, on kind of the program management behind the onboarding program. So you can see um, on the bottom right, there's, there's gonna about to be a question. So I'm gonna start the first poll and you should see this question. Do you think Cameron came up with the term education? I've locked the results right now. So lock in your votes and I'm gonna open in a moment. I would assume that someone will chat me or come off mute if this is breaking. And the fact that it, people are not doing those things means it must be working. So let's see. Um, wow, my like silly jokes have already worked. You get my sense of humor right away. Um, no, I did not come up with it, but I wish I did. And if you were listening closely, I've only been at Uber for uh, a year and a half, almost two years, and the program's been around five years. So didn't come up with it, wish I did. Um, the, the word education is now running all over the company and it's a really, really cool branding tool for us uh, and for the program. All right, so I'm gonna close that poll and we're gonna move on. Uh, I think if I do that, then it will, yes, perfect, cool. So here's the context on our, our global engineering community. Um, you can see here on the screen, uh, these are our global tech sites. We have offices all over the world. Um, if you think about kind of the products that, that Uber has in the, in the physical world, right, it would make sense for us to have some footprint in, in many countries. I, I could be wrong here, but I think we have some office in over 60 countries. Um, but what you're seeing on the screen is just our location of our tech offices where engineers work. Um, in a pre-COVID world, we are running education at seven different places all over the world. You can see they're starred in, in red. And the places that are not starred are smaller satellite offices where people travel to. Um, this created a really kind of interesting thing for us to work on and to, and to figure out. And I'm curious 
um, uh, in this group as we continue, just kind of what your experience is with global tech sites and, and global work. So I'm gonna, uh, because there's a join at the bottom of the slide, I'm gonna go to the next poll and I'm going to activate that. So go ahead and answer that for me. How many tech sites did your company have? There are options if you work not in you know, a traditional tech company, if you're not sure, it's not applicable, um, but let's see what we got. Take a few seconds and answer. Um, maybe, maybe flip back to the uh, QR code in case people miss. Oh, sure. Yeah, thank you. A hashtag TKC, yep. So let's see. And right here, you're seeing the count of responses. So I think there are 41 people at, and plus me and 32 are 33. So almost everyone's answering, which is pretty cool. So, wow. Um, I'm actually super surprised to see this, which is, which is really interesting that, uh, you know, the majority or not the majority a plurality of people have five or more tech sites. Um, if you only have one or it's not applicable, you're not sure. This is still, I think, interesting to you. Um, and, um, yeah, so it's it's totally relevant content. And if you think about the, the world that we're in right now of, of COVID and working remotely, right? Like the, the idea of physical tech sites has become everyone's home all over the world. So um, these are the guiding principles that we, and thanks for answering that poll. I'm gonna go ahead and deactivate that. And um, here are our guiding principles in, in the way that we think about onboarding at Uber. Uh, you can see them on the screen, but the, the first thing that we thought about in, in how to best scale the program and, and maintain the quality is the same course should have the same content. So no matter where you're onboarding in the world, whether it's in San Francisco at headquarters or it's in New York or it's at your home office um, or it's in India, if you are going through a course, say on site reliability engineering, that should be the same content, right? Those principles should exist from office to office, from location to location. The second thing is that, you know, given the, the cultural nuance, the local nuance, different charters that different sites have, like we, we our team in San Francisco has never wanted to prescribe exactly how the program should look at every site. We work with a cross-functional group of partners at our global sites and really lean on those folks, our stakeholders, managers, leaders, um, and people coming through the program um, to, to drive what content should be a part of the program. As an example here, we have a large payments engineering organization in Amsterdam that has uh, courses on the on payments org. We have a large like front end web presence at an office in India and in Hyderabad, and um, there's some additional content on, on our web engineering platforms. So by, by kind of making sure the core of the content is the same, but also leaning on local teams, uh, we were able to kind of develop a program that would that would maintain the same quality, but also give the local flavor. And not just kind of content specific local, but also the local culture. Certain places have, you know, our teams in Seattle love to come in and talk about like, what's unique about the office. They have this really cool roof deck and a view of Puget Sound. And they talk about that and the cultural things they do. Um, our program in Brazil uses our English materials, but it's all taught in Brazilian Portuguese. And that was a decision that we made, you know, with the site leadership and the stakeholders down there. So really, really heavily lean on those teams. And then the third one is, that I call like iterating at the right speed. We all work, you know, in tech companies in, in some form, uh, some way, shape or form. Um, and I think we're all really quick to reflect, be like, we should change that and just try something new right away. Right, be like, oh, that didn't go exactly well, I could totally change it. Or I got one small piece of feedback, let me flip exact, let me respond to that and totally change things. Our onboarding program is, is a pretty huge machine, right? We have um, somewhere between 150 and 300 people that facilitate. We have 10 different program managers. We have a bunch of managers and stakeholders and to make changes too fast doesn't allow us to, to like be thoughtful and be intentional around those changes. Sometimes things happen and we have to change really, really fast. Um, but we really try to think intentionally about if we get a piece of feedback or we make an observation or something changes in the program, do we have to change everything? How much do we have to change in kind of the scope of that? All that being said, right, seven months ago, a whole bunch of things happened um, and have been continuing to happen, which have required some changes. 
I just pulled some images here to highlight some of the challenges that that we've faced, you know, internally and externally. I put the word problems here in, in quotations because I, some of these things, you know, that may not be the right classification. Some of these things are long overdue changes, like the response in the U.S. and the world to, you know, social justice and what needs to change around that. The picture on the top left, if you're not sure, is the um, gates of Delhi in India. And that's one of the like the, the largest tourist attractions in the whole country and um, was completely shut down to, to pedestrians and to tourists and to car traffic um, during the national lockdown in India, which has an effect on our business and our product of people moving and things moving, but also on, on the culture of, of the work in India and people being home. Um, and then, you know, we, we have, have also made the decision to shift to remote work at least until July of next year. So all of these things have happened in the last six or seven months uh, that, have, that have required a response. But with that context and with this problem, there may also be some opportunity here. The picture on the left here is our training room in San Francisco. And we had to shift all of that to some version of what's on the right, some, some Zoom remote version. And you all probably have plenty of ideas about this. So I'm gonna to turn to Slido with an open-ended question. And that question is, what opportunities might there be with the shift to remote onboarding? Um, I've already opened it, but there's a 50 character limit here and you can throw in, um, more than one answer you should be able to. So let's see what people think. What opportunities may we have had or uh, with shifting to remote? Cool, I'm seeing some interesting things come in. Yeah, so we're, it, you, we can tell we're kind of all in the same space, right? A lot of the logistics have changed. Um, reaching a larger, more, uh, more diverse audience, completely agree. Being able to be more flexible. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to leave this open for another 15 seconds and then I'll move on. Cool, thanks for your thoughts. I, I very much agree with all these things. And now that we're in, believe it or not, this we're going here in month seven of, of onboarding remotely or working remotely for the most part, I'm sure we all are about or in our seventh month of this. Um, we started thinking about like, are there actually opportunities here? Like, can we leverage some of the ideas you all had? How can we actually use this, not as a, a terrible thing, but as, as a, a way to, to bring the program forward? And in fact, as we started thinking about it, the same principles apply, right? We're still gonna teach the same course uh, with the same content, no matter where you are. And that's really helped us for people who have been unable to relocate. Um, we have, uh, for example, someone who was supposed to start in San Francisco and relocate to India, but is stuck in India, but they can onboard in India, right? Because the same course um, has the same content, no matter where you're onboarding. Similarly, relying on our local teams for the local nuance. We dealt with, we dealt with a, a whole host of challenges around hardware shipping and logistics, um, which were completely different from city to city and country to country. We made some decisions on lengthening the program and shortening the program based on what else was going on in, in, in the world. And the third one here, of course, we didn't have exactly the luxury of iterating slowly uh, in March, but now that we're here in month seven, we're really thinking about well, how do we want this program to look moving forward? We're starting to think about, should we shrink the amount of time that people are you know, live in sessions and on video um, because of Zoom fatigue and because of just the kind of the, the way that adults learn, other challenges at home? Can we make things more self-paced? And rather than being like, cool, let's do that and plug it in and shift the entire program, we've slowly experimented and, and slowly made some changes around that. Here's how this has looked in practice. We've done a, a whole lot of facilitator training. And if you've been at Technocon events, you know, for some length of time, you probably remember Aaron Lenahan's presentation on this um, uh, 
and um, you know, has been really instrumental in thinking about how we train our facilitators. That's a, a shot of me trying to teach folks how to set up their screen and their monitor um, and uh, to, to, to be nice for teaching. We've collaborated with our regional and global partners given all the kind of crazy timeline that's happened. And we've really been intentional on collecting feedback from everyone, not just people that we would traditionally think to go to participants, but also to our facilitators, to managers. This is just a, a snip of um, one of our, our first feedback uh, questions to facilitators. And we learned that almost no one had facilitated remotely before. And that gave us some, some level setting on, on what folks needed to be successful. So we're totally not done. There's, there's more work to do. And I think for anyone that's involved in, in shifting a program to fully remote, you know that it's just a constant uh, you know, iteration, review, change. But I hope that kind of these, these guiding principles and the way that we're thinking about it at Uber helps um, give you some sense of, of what our principles are and, and, and helps you think about um, uh, what you might be able to bring to your program. So with that, I want to thank you for the time and I want to uh, ask you to humor me with one final slide out question, which is simply an opportunity for us to uh, see another feature, which is a rating system. So this is just another way to capture and let's see what people think. Cool. Let's give this for 15 more seconds. Awesome. I'm glad that people found that to be a useful part of this talk. Um, and before I kick it to Marco for, for Q&A, let me just also say that um, I am a Slido novice. So if you have specific questions in the Q&A about Slido and the features, like. I'm definitely not the person to go to. I would encourage you to um, play around with it on your own. We do have the benefit of an enterprise account at, at Uber that I was able to use and open up to this group. I'm happy to kind of take that discussion offline. And if you're a Slido expert, that'd be a cool topic for Slack. But I know that that's a pretty cool thing that not everyone knew about and now we all know. Um, so just wanted to give that caveat before we switch to Q&A. So I'll stop sharing and uh, kick it back over to Marco. Thanks. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, let me uh, just pop up my, you should be seeing my screen now. Uh, cool, so with that, that was Cameron. Um, so thank you. Um, uh, I, was, I was gonna say, hey, let's keep you know, having questions in the, in the chat, but Slido, I think was, uh, was better, more interactive for sure. So thank um, I, I love it, the first time that I've seen it, so that's awesome. Um, so a couple of questions that came up. Uh, there was a question from Stuart about developing courses. Uh, so what is your team responsible for versus the SMEs? So in other words, um, how much do you uh, sort of gatekeep the content yourself versus just kind of outsource it to the edges of the organization to develop it on themselves? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I would say it, it is dependent course to course. Um, our kind of the the teams that to drive the content, for example, a course on security principles is, is driven and initially curated by the security team. With our help, as we all know from working with SMEs across companies, everyone needs a nudge. So I meet with the folks that facilitate and stakeholder teams once a month um, and, and make sure to drive things forward. If there's a, a new proposal for a course, um, we'll work with them from the very beginning on, on course development, but we don't, um, own any of the content. We rely on stakeholder teams and we do, you know, act as a, a bit of a clearinghouse and what can go into onboarding to make sure it follows those principles and is applicable to all engineers. Um, but if there, if there is a need for something new, then we'll, we'll try it out. We'll pilot it at one site, check out feedback before we put it into the global program. Got it. So it's Thanks for the question. And working with them to, to, to do that. Yeah. Awesome. And there's a, the, the usual question that we always get is how do you measure the impact of onboarding, uh, right? And especially to that Kirkpatrick level two and above, right? So how do you actually measure that there's, there's an impact to, to work uh, that, that one does? So that zero to 60. Yeah, so it's a really good question and something that we've, we've been in the weeds with, you know, as long as I've been at Uber and, and our team 
Aaron Sage and Matthew and I that, that on the team are, are still very much talking about is how can we quantify the ramp up time and how and what does that really look like um, right now in like current state we're really just looking at satisfaction um, we do dive a little bit deeper in talking with managers and getting anecdotal feedback and we just started running some focus groups to look at how onboarding works to get a little bit more detailed feedback um, but our, our eventual goal is to, to map this directly to productivity and, and ramp up time but we, we just haven't cracked that code yet Got it, got it. Cool, thanks. Um, and, and, and like that's usually the answer that everyone's kind of like more suspended in the question itself than actually having the, the definitive answer. So, uh, so thanks for sharing that insight as well. Uh, so Jade Law is asking how much of onboarding is uh, self-paced versus uh, uh, in person, um, especially with the move to online and everything. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so initially in March, everything was live and facilitated over Zoom. We decided that we wanted to make everything look like it did in person, but do it over Zoom. Learn quickly that that isn't exactly the best way for folks to learn um, and also requires a, a whole bunch of facilitators. There's now no reason that we have a specific program and facilitator in San Francisco and one in Seattle. We can just put them in the same Zoom um, and use one less engineer. So we've experimented with that. So we've combined time zones for most, for most uh, folks. Um, in terms of self-paced, we're experimenting with that right now. Um, Sage on, on, on the training team uh, has done an amazing job of kind of moving all of our content to self-paced and we're trying it out when we have small uh, cohorts um, or like a, a upper level person who maybe doesn't have the time to sit through three full days of sessions, but we haven't fully made the move yet. So right now it's, it's kind of like, you're either getting the full live where everything is live experience, or you're getting a self-paced independent recordings, quizzes, um, slide deck review. We just haven't decided on how we're gonna go in the future. There is also, I, this is a long answer. I know there's a lot of questions and people hate when someone answers too long, but here I go. Um, there is also a cultural component here of, of allowing new hires to meet more people in the org and allowing people in the org the opportunity to teach because I think we all know that that is like a really nice opportunity for professional growth and for connection to new hires. So we don't wanna just completely cut that out. So if we do move to a self-paced model, we wanna really make sure that we're continuing to engage the, the community of facilitators that we've worked really hard to build. Got it, so, so you're, you're biasing toward live in person um, uh, learning over Zoom uh, versus self-paced uh, consuming content, static content. Got it. Yep. Uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of uh, chat around uh, engineering onboarding. Uh, Jasmine offered to from Netflix offered to compare notes. I, I know Netflix is doing some amazing stuff uh, with respect to that. Love love, love their experience. So uh, maybe, maybe Slack would be a good opportunity to uh, continue that conversation, or maybe I'll challenge Jasmine to. Uh, to uh, speak at TechCon uh, one, of, one of these days. So we'll, we'll chat about that, but it seems like it's a lively and relevant topic. So and onboarding and how to go about that. And I also saw some conversations around uh, in, in, in making that blended. So in other words, self-paced, alive, mentorship, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so we can talk about that. Cool. So with that, um, I wanted to uh, th thank you, Cameron. We ha we still have uh, um, closing breakouts, so I'll let uh, Marianne uh, put us in a breakout room so that we can still interact with our peers, and then we'll come back and uh, continue the conversation. And wrap cool. Up. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Great comment. Give the um, uh, the group reflections uh, just because of the time. Um, just as a final, final parting notes, uh, this is a community for us by us. So we depend on speakers, people who raise their hand and say, hey, I have something that I'm proud of, that's cool, that I wanna share with the community. So just like Cameron was uh, you know, proud of how they do uh, engineering onboarding at scale globally um, and uh, biasing live learning uh, over self-paced and so on and, and so, so we're always looking for stories like that so if you are doing something cool or know of somebody who's doing something cool worth sharing please ping us uh, Marianne is always there uh, and I also want to acknowledge Marianne for running everything behind the scenes 
um, or just you know otherwise reach out to us but we're looking for speakers um, again as a reminder we're, we're going to skip uh, October so that folks in Canada can have a great Thanksgiving uh, and we are going to be back in November uh, with something uh, a little bit more longer so uh, ideally a couple of more speakers so just kind of heads up and uh, also as a reminder the conversation doesn't only happen uh, during the roundtables. We also have all these different channels uh, of which uh, Slack is probably the most active. So uh, join Slack if you haven't. Uh, there's, a cha there's a channel there to say hi and introduce yourself. So please do. And with that, thank you. And thank you, Cameron, uh, for, for your talk. Um, and thank you all for participating.